We are fortunate enough to live during a time of advanced technology. Just 20 years ago, the idea of you being able to access and download this video from anywhere in the world using a device that wasn't connected to any kind of wire would be unthinkable. Someone had to invent the technology that we rely upon to make this experience happen. We know how the technology of the internet was created and how it works though. What we don't know is how any of the technology you're about to see in this video existed during the era that it comes from. Everything about the discovery of this 1100-year-old Viking sword on a Norwegian mountain is strange. No Viking artifact has ever been located at such a high altitude before. It was nearly 5,500 feet above sea level, where the air is thin, and no evidence of any Viking life around it has been discovered. There wasn't even a body with the sword, which makes us wonder what happened to its owner. Also, given its age, it's in astonishingly good condition and appears to have been cast as one whole solid piece of steel. In every way imaginable, it's an out-of-place artifact, and one which was manufactured in a manner that seems entirely at odds with any other Viking sword ever discovered. The lack of oxygen and the fact that the mountain is coated in ice for half of every year would preserve it to some extent, but even then it should be more rusted than this. What was this sword doing so far from home? And who made it in the first place? If you want to store ice in warm weather, you'll need a freezer. To our modern minds, that would necessitate the use of electricity to power the freezer with. But our ancestors didn't have the luxury of electricity 2,400 years ago. Despite that, they appeared to understand the basic principles that guide the freezing process, which is how the ancient Persians were able to build yakels in the middle of the desert. The name yakel translates into English as ice pit, but the buildings don't resemble pits. They look more like grand mounds or temples. On average, each yakel was 60 feet tall and contained a system of water funneled in from nearby springs and wind catchers to cool the water with, allowing for frozen items to maintain their state. The innovative evaporative cooling system inside the structures means that even today, when you go and stand inside one, you'll feel like you've stepped into a giant refrigeration unit. A coating of clay, sand, egg whites, and goat hairs on the exterior insulated the domes against the heat of the desert sun, even in the middle of summer. The Mold Gold Cape spent hundreds of years hidden away inside a hill in Wales, Great Britain. When it was eventually discovered in 1833, the experts of the time looked upon it in wonder. Then, just as now, it represents the most exquisite piece of gold working ever discovered from prehistoric Europe. The strange hill it was found inside also worked as its protector. It's known as the Goblin Hill, and superstitions about its supernatural properties kept locals away from it for centuries. Dating back to the Bronze Era, the garment was probably ritualistic wear for an individual of high status, either a royal or a religious figure. The cape's size suggests the owner was female, and may even have been a forgotten queen of ancient Britain. Gold craftsmanship like this from thousands of years ago is usually associated more with the ancient Egyptians than the ancient Europeans, and even they would have been hard-pressed to come up with something this ornate and detailed. In the 21st century, modern militaries fantasize about having high-powered laser technology to defeat their enemies quickly and easily. 1,400 years ago, the armies of the Byzantine Empire were using a technology that worked to similar principles. They came up with something known as Greek fire, a primitive flamethrower that could ignite an enemy ship from a distance. It was first recorded as being used in Constantinople in the year 673 and might even have ignited upon contact with the water. No other empire or civilization of the time had a weapon anything like as powerful, and its existence was crucial to both the salvation and the spread of the Byzantines. They even manufactured pressure hoses to concentrate the fire of the liquid, which must have been an awesome and terrifying spectacle. Even today, historians can't agree on the precise chemical composition of Greek fire. It's thought that quicklime, sulfur, naphtha, and calcium phosphide were involved, but the secret of its ingredients, and therefore the key to recreating it, has been lost to time. 
The creation of the Mamantillo in Peru was so far ahead of its time that even now, 1300 years after its invention, the principles behind it are being recreated to assist modern cities during times of drought. In basic terms, a Mamantillo is a system used to harvest water from wet, mountainous regions and redirect it down to ground level where it can create reservoirs and water deposits, thus saving whole cities from going thirsty during the heat of the summer. Displaying a unique understanding of the absorption properties of various types of stone and mud, the pre-Columbian civilization who built the first Mamantillos used a series of water channels not dissimilar to canals to redirect water as it ran off the mountains, diverting it to permeable rock and soil where it would take time to penetrate through layers of solid ground. Weeks or sometimes months later, the water would re-emerge further down the slope, where it could be safely collected and stored. It's thought that the Andean Wari culture was the first to use mamantillos, although it's impossible to say for sure. Our modern ability to take satellite images of remote locations is shedding new light on ancient mysteries left behind by our ancestors. NASA was responsible for taking the first pictures of the steppe geoglyphs in Kazakhstan, but not even they can explain who made them, or why they were arranged in such unusual shapes. There are over 250 ramparts and mounds in the area, covering the region of northern Turgai and dating back to the Neolithic era. The geoglyphs take the shape of crosses, circles, and even curly swastikas but wouldn't be visible when seen from the ground. They could only be made sense of from high above. As the people who made them didn't have the technology to fly, why would they build things that nobody would be able to see clearly for thousands of years? We think of the people of this era as little more than primitive tribes of hunter-gatherers, yet projects like creating these geoglyphs would require mass cooperation and organization. Perhaps civilization as we know it started a lot earlier than we think it did. Some of the examples of ancient technology we are showing in this video are open to interpretation. But here's one that's a solid, recognized scientific fact. The people who lived 2,000 years ago were better at gilding objects than we are today. And science is at a total loss to explain how it was done. Literally hundreds of gilded items have been recovered from the era, including decorative items taken from temples, and yet we've never found any explanation as to how the gilding was done. If we used electroplating, we could achieve an effect similar to the one we see on some of these old artifacts. But it still wouldn't quite match it for quality. And that's before we even consider the point that electroplating didn't exist until the 19th century. In some cases, it would appear that a thin layer of mercury was used as a solvent to bind thin sheets of gold and silver to objects as decoration. But such a method would be considered insanely dangerous, even with modern precautions. The criminals of 2,000 years ago used their gilding skills to disguise low-value objects as much more valuable items. But we can't even replicate the capabilities of the fraudsters. Hidden away in the ancient Sanskrit and Hindu text is a series of references that scientists would rather nobody paid any attention to because they suggest a troubling piece of lost technology. Specifically, we're talking about Vimanas. The stories of Vimanas are generally seen as fanciful myths about flying chariots or even whole flying palaces. But there are worryingly descriptive sections of text that strongly imply that the writers have seen them working in real life. The oldest mention, found in the Veda Sanskrit text written 3,500 years ago, describes jumping into the air in a craft that uses fire and water, and goes on to explain the internal arrangement of the aircraft, which included a wheel, 12 pillars, 300 pivots, and 60 controls. The Ramayana texts also refer to the manas, and state that they were a luxury reserved only for the ruling elite. Looking at the Mahabharata texts, we find descriptions of not only flying machines, but flying machines that used sound technology to fire missiles at targets on the ground. All of these things are recorded in black and white. So why does nobody speak of them? We've already seen one take on ancient refrigeration technology from the ancient world. But here's a different take on the idea from ancient China. 
It's called a jian, and the oldest example of one discovered so far is more than 2,500 years old. Primarily used as a means of chilling wine and keeping it fresh, jians worked so well that they were still in everyday use in China until the 17th century, meaning the idea could be considered more than 4,000 years ahead of its time. A jian is made out of bronze, containing two layers with a thin layer of ice between them to keep the contents of the inner layer cool. After looking at this, we're left to conclude that the Chinese people of ancient times were very serious about looking after their wine. We are also left to conclude that whoever came up with this idea was such a genius that nobody could improve on their design for several millennia. One way of describing the Hal Safliani Hypogeum in Malta would be as an underground mass grave containing more than 7,000 bodies. That's a fairly grim description, so it might be more helpful to think of it as a beautiful work of art made by unknown builders using incredible skills. Incredibly, even though the 6,000-year-old structure sits barely 30 feet below the busy streets of Malta, it wasn't discovered until someone tried to build a water cistern in 1902. The whole sweeping, curving hypogeum is carved directly into limestone and splits into three layers. The final chamber has been designed in such a way that any sound made inside it echoes throughout the whole structure and can resonate within the human mind to affect the emotions. This is known as infrasound technology, and its existence should have been way beyond the comprehension of people living 1500 years before Stonehenge was built in England. Even more mysteriously, the skulls of many of the bodies buried there are elongated compared to modern standards, and testing has revealed that the elongation was a genetic trait. Who were these long-skulled people? And how did they understand so much about sound engineering? When do you imagine the human race first began fitting prosthetic limbs and digits to people who were missing them? Unless you guessed 3,000 years ago, then you're wrong. Not only do we know that the ancient Egyptians were making prosthetics 3,000 years ago, but they were making them out of wood. And we can prove it because here's an example that survived to this day. This wooden toe was found still attached to the ancient Egyptian mummy it was buried with, and close inspection of it has revealed it was refitted and re-engineered to fit the foot of its owner better several times before she was buried. That means that the expert who designed and fitted it for her had an understanding of human physiology that would be considered stunningly advanced for the time they lived in. Modern prosthetics researchers have been very complimentary about the quality of the prosthesis, which would have been fitted with a belt strap, and thus been as mobile as the rest of her foot. Safely navigating a ship across the ocean has never been an easy job, even with all the benefits of modern technology. Without GPS, digital maps, and an understanding of the tides, it would be even harder. 500 years ago, mariners set off across the oceans almost blind, apart from the limited maps they had available to them. But it seems they did have one basic tool, an astrolabe like this one, which is thought to be the oldest marine navigation tool in the world. It was found in the wreck of the Esmeralda, a Portuguese ship that sank in 1503, trying to cross the Indian Ocean. At first glance, it was thought to be nothing more than a steel medallion or piece of jewelry, but digital scanning at the University of Warwick in England revealed details that had been eroded too badly to be seen by the naked eye. As can be seen here, the device is covered by notches, ridges, and other markings around the edges, all of which are positioned at intervals of 5 degrees. That strongly suggests that this is an astrolabe, and a navigator would be able to use it to measure the position of the sun in the sky. That, in turn, would help them track both the time of day and their relative direction. Subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell, and enjoy watching new videos on my channel. Thanks for watching and see you soon!